Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to our Community Connection event, working with reactive dogs. I'm really glad you're all here. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about what reactivity really is um, and how we can help our dogs kind of overcome um, this reactivity. So uh, I'll just start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Robin, and I am a member of the training team here at the Santa Fe Animal Shelter. Um, I've been here for about a year now, uh, and I really, really love these events. Um, I'm really happy that we're able to reach so many people um, who are interested in these topics. Um, I'm also really, really glad to be a part of um, a very well-educated team here at the shelter. Um, the logos that you see at the bottom of the screen are um, just some of the um, organizations that we're affiliated with as a team. Um, so we're, we're really, really uh, lucky to have such a great team at the shelter. Um, just before we get started, um, I wanted to talk about a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so you all came in muted, and I just ask that you remain muted uh, throughout the presentation unless um, I've prompted for questions. Um, that just helps things go smoothly and allows everybody to get the time in that they need. Um, if you are worried about forgetting your question uh, and you have it in kind of the, the middle of a slide and I haven't asked for questions yet, you're welcome to put that in the chat and I'll take a look at that at each um, question slide. So I will um, also be getting to those questions. Um, we're also recording this uh, for training purposes, so uh, just be aware of that. And um, if you do at any point have any trouble hearing or seeing me or any of the things in the presentation, um, do let me know through the chat and I will try to get that fixed for you. Um, and now that I've uh, kind of introduced myself and we've talked a little bit about the housekeeping, I do also want to um, talk about our shelter for a little bit. Um, so, our uh, shelter is a life-saving community, and what that means is that we really do our best to get uh, our animals the help that they need, um, and we really can't do that without your support. So, so thank you so much um, for the support that you're giving us just by being here, um, but also if you uh, foster or adopt um, or donate, um, all of those things, we really, really appreciate them. They allow us to be um, who we are, so thank you. Um, and also a huge thank you to Purina um, for sponsoring these Community Connection events um, and being a very generous supporter of the Santa Fe Animal Shelter. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started, and I'm just going to turn off my video so that you all can focus in on the presentation. Okay, uh, so these are the topics that we're going to be discussing today in our presentation. Um, so we're going to be going over what reactivity is and why our dogs um, act the way that they do. And then we're going to go through uh, the management ideas and then um, training skills and something called counter conditioning, um, which we'll talk about later um, that can help our dogs um, work through this reactivity. All right, um, so let's talk about what reactivity really is. Uh, the reactivity stems from a dog's really intense emotional response to a particular trigger, right? So the dog uh, might get excited in either a positive way where they really want to interact with the trigger or in a negative way where maybe they're afraid of the trigger, right? And that will be in response to seeing or hearing or sometimes even just smelling the trigger. Um, this can often occur when dogs are restricted by a leash, a fence, or um, even something like a window, right? Leashes and barriers, those restrict freedom of motion and really cause our dogs to feel increasingly vulnerable and frustrated. Um, so you can actually think of reactivity as kind of emotional dysregulation or really just our dogs, a lack of ability to moderate their own emotions and to show restraint. Um, so this is really similar to how you might see young kids react um, in these sort of acutely emotional ways to things that might seem really insignificant, right? Um, you can see that this kid is in the middle of, of some kind of a tantrum, um, even while he's eating, right? Um, so 
Uh, this is, you know, something that is common between uh, dogs and young children is that a lot of the time they just um, don't know how to regulate their emotions, right? Um, they don't know how to get upset but not throw a tantrum um, or cry or smash things or for our dogs, right, um, barking or jumping or all of those other things that they might um, do out of just kind of this overabundance of emotion. Um, it's it's really important to kind of keep that in mind as you're dealing with uh, reactivity because it's, it's so easy for us too to become upset in the sort of presence of such uh, emotional expressions, right? Um, and so it's, it's really, really good to keep that in mind as you're working with your dog, right? They're not doing it on purpose. They're just um, really not sure how to deal with those sort of overwhelming emotions that they're experiencing. Okay, so, so what does reactivity look like, right? Um, oftentimes when we're thinking of reactivity, we usually think of a dog at the end of a leash, right? A lunging, uh, barking, straining forward, right? Those are all our really common um, ideas about what reactivity looks like. Um, but it can look like a lot of different things, right? Um, they might just have a really tense body and they might be holding stock still, right? That can be uh, reactivity. Um, they also might hide or tuck their tails um, or urinate, right? Um, all of those different things um, can be a sign of, again, that sort of um, overwhelming emotional reaction. It's really important to kind of get an idea of why reactivity happens in our dogs um, as we're talking about this. Right, there's a, a lot of people who, you know, um, might think that, oh, it's just because, you know, the owner hasn't done uh, enough training or, you know, this, this and that. Um, but really there are a lot of uh, potential underlying causes um, to why reactivity does develop. Um, and, you know, the first and probably most obvious one of these is uh, genetics, right? So some dogs are just uh, predisposed to be more nervous or more fearful. Um, just by their breeding, right? And that might be, uh, you know, based on their actual breed, but it could also be um, things like, you know, how stressed their mother was uh, during pregnancy, right? It could be uh, a whole bunch of different things that we're only barely learning uh, about the surface level things up right now as far as genetics go. Um, but there definitely are those um, certain dogs that are predisposed to that. Um, now, you can also think about uh, the upbringing of a dog, right? So we've got a little puppy picture here. Um, you know, when puppies are, um, when our dogs are young, um, they need to be really well socialized to our strange human world in order to not be afraid of a lot of the things um, that naturally they would be. Um, so a lot of things are weird to our dogs, and that's why socialization is so important. So if a dog has had a lack of socialization, um, maybe even, you know, with just a, a couple of things, right? Like they never saw a man in a bowler hat when they were young. Um, and so now uh, men in bowler hats are scary, right? So just, just thinking about, uh, you know, kind of that lack of socialization and, and what that can really um, lead to in our, in our dogs as well. Um, and then there is also pain, right? Um, so if you're dog was not reactive and they've been fine for their whole lives and then all of a sudden they're starting to be reactive, um, that can definitely be a sign of um, some sort of underlying medical cause, right? So in those instances, um, reactivity uh, might actually come from this place of I'm in so much pain that my stress levels are already so high that every little thing is now pushing me um, over the top, right? And, and now we're reacting to everything. Um, and then, of course, you know, their, their home environments, right? Are they uh, stressful and chaotic? Um, you know, have, have they uh, seen a bunch of screaming children lately? And that's just really overwhelming. And now every time they see a child, um, you know, they're reacting to that, right? So thinking about recent life events um, that might have contributed to uh, reactivity. Um, a, a pretty typical one is, you know, um, they were walking on leash and some off-leash dogs ran up. Um, and they had a sort of altercation, right? So now they're reacting to every dog that they see on leash. Uh, so, so that's definitely, um, you know, something, something to think about when you are um, trying to figure out why your dog 
might be reacting the way that they are. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions at all about what we've just talked about? Um, and if you do, you are welcome to unmute or to type into the chat whatever is most comfortable for you. Great. Um, well, if you think of any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat and I'll get to them um, at the next question slide. Okay, um, so now we're kind of getting into more of how we do help our dogs um, change their emotions around those things that are triggering their reactive behaviors. Um, the first step of that is management and prevention. Um, and what that just means is we're looking at how we can prevent our dogs from practicing the reactive behaviors and from feeling those overwhelming emotions that they will continue to associate with those triggers if they're allowed to do that. Um, so once we have that sort of management and prevention in place, then we can work on training our dogs, right, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so here on the screen, you'll see um, the hierarchy of dog needs. Um, and this is just kind of showing um, everything that our dog needs to have a healthy and safe life. Um, so part of thinking about why our dogs are being reactive is thinking about um, what needs of theirs maybe aren't being met, right? So um, for example, right, dogs at the shelter are not having some of their um, emotional and social needs being met. Um, and so they're much more likely to be um, reactive at their barriers, right? Think of the, the sort of like quintessential dog barking um, as you walk through um, the, the shelter to look for dogs, right? So um, that, that can be kind of an example of, right, um, sometimes it just needs can't be met in certain places. Um, and, you know, maybe your dog hasn't been getting enough sleep, right? That's a basic biological need. Um, and if they're lacking sleep, um, they're going to be in a higher state of stress. Um, probably most of us are also familiar with that feeling, right? If we haven't gotten enough sleep, um, everything is harder the next day, right? Um, so thinking about that, thinking about nutrition, um, thinking about, uh, you know, a sense of security, right? If um, they've just moved across the country, um, they're going to be a lot more, um, you know, sort of out of place and out of that sense of security and routine that they're used to. Um, so that can be very stressful, right? So all of these things kind of contribute to, um, you know, how our dogs are feeling and, and also give us an idea of um, how we might be able to help them and, and really um, make their lives um, better. Um, so first, what we're going to talk about is exercise. So oftentimes, reactivity can uh, come about from a sort of overabundance of energy and excitement, right? Um, so, so if we're thinking about maybe you know going for a walk and they are just you know so excited that they're jumping at everybody that they pass and all of that, um, something that can really help that is getting our dogs exercise beforehand, right, inside the house or somewhere where they're not going to encounter any of those triggers. Um, and that can definitely help uh, lead to a calmer walk. Um, so this video shows a fun game to play inside with your dog to go over and under things. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and play this video for you guys. Hi, y'all. I'm trainer Donna, and this is my dog. <laughs> and this is your training tip Tuesday. So today we're cozying up at home because even though uh, my favorite enrichment activity and my dog's favorite enrichment activity is to get outdoors, there are times when that's just not possible. Maybe it's uh, too cold, too wet, or hazardous outside, um, and then we might get stuck indoors. And so for those times, we wanna give you some easy enrichment activities that you can try at home with your dog too. One easy way to check off the boxes for both physical and mental exercise for the day is to teach your dog to jump over an object and go under an object. This is a great alternative to destructive play. Use household objects to set up a jump that is elbow height or lower for your dog. Start by taking a tasty treat and holding it up to your dog's nose and then slowly luring them over the jump. Click as they jump and then release the treat when they land. 
Next, try it again, but this time without a treat in your hand. If your dog is good at nose targeting, use a flat palm. If your dog is struggling, you can make the jump easier by angling it before making it an even plane. Advance this by making the jump a little higher or a little more narrow. Use household objects to create a bridge that is easy for your dog to walk under. You'll want it to be tall and wide enough for your dog to feel comfortable moving through it. Repeat the process starting with a lure and then fading the lure into a hand signal. Good job. Good girl. As you're advancing your bridge, making it lower or more narrow, be aware of what it looks, feels, and sounds like to your dog. Your dog may get spooked, and if that happens, it's okay. We're going to fix the bridge, and then we're going to reintroduce our dog to it, making sure that our dogs are comfortable and enjoying the experience. Because remember, this is all about having fun. Oh, good girl. All right, so that just is kind of um, an overview of something you can do inside with, with your dog, um, but any way that you can get them exercise um, that is beneficial to them is going to be really, really helpful um, in addressing reactivity. Hi, y'all. I'm trainer. All right, um, so next we're going to talk about enrichment. Um, this is another extremely important aspect of getting your dog into a state of mind where they can learn. Um, so enrichment is any activity that gets your dog engaging in natural dog behaviors. So those are things like uh, chewing or digging or shredding or sniffing um, and problem solving. Right? Those are all things that um, require our dog's um, attention and focus and that they really, really enjoy. Um, so providing your dog with several enrichment activities per day, um, like a stuffed Kong, like you see in the picture here, um, or a food puzzle, or a treat treasure hunt, or some other use for their nose, right, nose work, anything like that, um, that can tire them out in productive and healthy ways. Enrichment and at-home exercise become extra important when we're talking about um, this particular management strategy, which is avoiding your dog's triggers. Um, so if you have a dog that reacts to bikes or garbage trucks or people or dogs walking by on the street, um, the best thing to do is either walk them at uh, times of day or in places where they won't encounter the triggers um, or to just stick to the yard and the house until you can really start the training process. Um, so, so really definitely um, thinking about, you know, if your dog is so reactive that every time you go out on walks, it's just miserable. Or, you know, every time they go out in the yard and somebody walks by the fence, uh, you know, they're um, really uh, getting upset, right? That's when we want to um, think about, okay, is it better for them if we just entirely avoid this um, by not going um, for, for walks and going out in the backyard, maybe on a leash, um, if they're reacting at the fence? Right, so really thinking about um, avoiding those triggers to keep them from practicing, again, that um, emotional response, right? We really don't want them um, to get the idea that that's just the way that they respond to things um, by barking or lunging or, or being very fearful. All right, so, so if you are out on a walk and your dog sees another dog, um, or if your dog lunges and barks at people walking on the other side of the fence, uh, the best thing to do is to get distance. Um, so you want to get enough distance that your dog can, again, access that sort of learning brain, right, where, where they're more relaxed um, and confident. So for some dogs, this might be just five feet away. Um, for some dogs, it might be 20. For some, it might be 300, right? Um, it all depends on the individual dog and sort of the intensity of their emotional response um, to that trigger. So you really want to get to a distance where you can see your dog relax and where they can re-engage with you and um, you know, keep doing sort of their normal behaviors, walking in a nice loose way instead of being very tense, right? Um, or being able to just sniff the ground 
instead of fixate on something, right? Um, so, you know, on, on, on a walk, it might be um, crossing the road uh, or turning off the trail um, or, you know, even just walking in the opposite direction if you see somebody way up ahead, right? So kind of keeping an eye out on the environment around you um, so that you can be ready to get your dog out of those situations that might upset them. Um, if your dog has a barrier reactivity in the yard, you might set up something like a smaller temporary fence away from the edge of the fence so that they can't go right up to it. Um, that, that can be a good um, temporary way to kind of help them or like I mentioned earlier, um, going out with them on leash and supervise so that they don't engage in those uh, types of behaviors. Um, but really any way you can get distance is good. Um, another really important uh, aspect of this is keeping a loose leash. So anytime that we are adding tension to the leash by pulling on it, um, that will increase the sense of restriction and frustration that our dog is feeling and can actually escalate um, those sorts of reactive behaviors. Uh, so when we are um, looking at, uh, you know, trying to get off the trail or something, if our dog is already fixated on something and we're then trying to turn off and adding tension to that leash, um, that can actually uh, make them pull against us harder, right? So you may have seen that, right, with the dog kind of standing up at the end of the leash, which are really pulling against it if we're trying to pull them in the opposite direction. Um, so something that can help with uh, keeping a loose leash is um, having food with you on your walk. And I don't mean just like, you know, kind of kibble or you know, dry biscuits. I mean like really tasty food um, mm -hmm. that might distract them in the instance of smelly things, right? Like hot dogs or cheese or um, peanut butter in a little jar, right? Anything that you can just use to get them out of that situation in a way um, without adding any additional pressure to the situation. Um, a good way to know um, and to kind of uh, keep track of if your leash is loose is if you can see um, this sort of J shape in the leash. So um, if you can see my cursor here, it's a little bit of a J shape um, going from the dog's collar up to the person's hand. Um, now, if the leash is straight, um, that's when your leash is too tight. Even if your dog is not really pulling against it, um, if you pulled it so tight that um, that that it's straight instead of curved like that, it's too tight and it's a good idea to loosen that up again. Um, part of, you know, how to um, keep your dog safe um, on leash and to help with this reactivity again is to use um, safe walking equipment. So if your dog, um, you know, likes to kind of pull on leash um, and they're wearing something like a flat buckle collar, um, you know, that can really um, add, uh, first of all, add a lot of pressure, um, which will, again, sort of escalate their behaviors, but it might also be adding pain, right, if it's pushing against their trachea. Um, so thinking about getting something like a harness, right, where they, um, you know, where if they are pulling, it's just going to be into their chest where they're very strong and powerful. Um, or, and also um, this harness that's pictured here has a little clip on the front. Um, and you can kind of see that here. Um, and that is a, a really nice design. It's called a front clip harness, right? Um, and that is really nice because when they do pull forward, um, they're actually sort of redirected to the side um, by pushing forward into the leash. And that can help um, get them back within the length of the leash so it's loose again, and then get have them um, kind of be able to get uh, their attention back on you as you get them uh, at a safe distance. Um, we also want to use things like fixed length leashes um, as opposed to something like a retractable leash, right, where your dog has uh, sort of this full range, but you don't really have that much control about bringing it back in, um, especially with um, a dog that, you know, like, like the pull on leash, um, that's uh, something that can be really dangerous with the longer uh, uh, retractable leashes because they, um, yeah, they'll, they'll hit the end of that and you have no leverage at all um, to get them uh, out of there, right? So it's really important um, that you uh, have a fixed length leash and a safe harness um, or something else that they can um, really feel um, comfortable in, right? It's also really important to 
make sure that your dog is comfortable in their walking equipment. Um, so if you go to put the harness on and your dog kind of shies away, um, that's definitely uh, you know, an indicator that maybe they're not really that comfortable with the harness. Um, so working on making really positive associations with that um, and, and pairing it with food and good things so that they learn not to be afraid because any additional um, stressor will then add to the likelihood of them having a reaction while they're out and about. Um, this also kind of goes for, you know, if your dog is barrier reactive in other instances, right? Um, we don't want to be pulling them away uh, by their collar. We want to be luring them away and we want to um, make sure that they're always um, feeling safe in the equipment that they're wearing, um, whether that's a collar or a heart. Okay, uh, does anyone have any questions about these? Uh, management strategies um, that we just talked about. And again, you're welcome to unmute or to type into the chat. Um, hi, I do have a question about the Kong, the Kong toy. Yes. Uh, can you tell us what that is and what you, how it works and where you get that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's, that's a great question. So um, the Kong is um, a solid rubber toy um, that has a big hole in the top. And so you can um, stuff all kinds of things into the top of the Kong. And so your dog has to kind of work and lick and toss the Kong around to get those things out. Um, it's a great way to kind of keep them occupied. Um, and also for them to really have to work to get the food out. Uh, and there's, you know, not a lot of fun in just eating straight out of a bowl, um, but out of a con, they, you know, they might enjoy that. It will take them a little bit longer. Uh, so you can get cons um, anywhere online or at most pet stores, um, and they come in varying sizes and durability. So if you have a really strong chewer, they make these um, really heavy duty black colored uh, cons um, that are um, really tough to, to chew through. Um, the red Kong that you saw in the picture is the classic version. Um, and then there's sort of the softer uh, blue Kongs for younger dogs or smaller dogs. And they have all different sizes. Um, and yeah, there's lots of things you can put in there um, from your dog's kibble to um, oatmeal or peanut butter. Um, and there's tons of recipes out there um, for people who uh, have made some pretty creative stuffing ideas for their Kongs. Uh, so, so yeah, definitely taking a look at that. Um, and that's something too that uh, we'll be sending out a uh, follow-up email after this presentation and I can um, give some links to the Macomb stuffing ideas uh, so that you have those references. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so, so now we're going to get kind of into the training aspect of this. So we talked about um, what uh, what we can do to help manage the situation so our dogs are practicing the behavior, um, but we don't want to have to manage them forever, right? And that's where the training comes in. Um, so, so now we're going to talk about kind of the, the precursor training that you can work on at home while you're managing your dog to help set them up for success. Um, when you do start working outside again. Um, so the most important thing to talk about here are uh, the rewards that we're using for our dogs during training. Um, so there's a big difference in the value of a steak versus the value of kibble, right? So um, when you are working with uh, dogs that are very distracted by their environment, um, or can very easily go over threshold, you might want to pull out the steak, right? Um, just like we were talking about on, on, on the walks to use a kind of a lure, right? Kibble's not going to cut it, but a steak might. Uh, and so, so uh, thinking about that, and then thinking about um, kind of the size of the rewards that you're using. We don't want to overfeed our dogs, um, so cutting them into small little pieces, um, kind of kibble-sized pieces would be good. Um, and, and using those as our uh, as our reward for the behaviors that we want to see more of. 
All right. Um, so, so how do we start teaching our dog? Um, the best way to do that is to use um, clicker training. And so we have a video here, again, that's sort of an introduction to clicker training. Um, and this will just give you a nice overview of how we start setting our dogs up um, for success in this training for the activity. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Clicker training is one of the easiest ways to teach a dog new tricks. It also helps you bond with your dog, whether they're a longtime friend or a new addition. To help you and your dog on your training journey, we want to share some tips with you that will help keep training fun, fast, and successful. Use a clicker and buy lots of extras. You'll want to have plenty on hand. Once your dog knows a behavior really well, you won't need the clicker around, but you'll want to pull out the clicker every time you're teaching a new behavior. Protect your clicker. Remember that the sound of the click is a promise to your dog that you're going to pay out. Protect that promise and the value of the sound of the clicker by following each click with a treat. Even those pesky times that you maybe click for the wrong thing. Practice clicking and then treating. Separating these actions out helps your dog learn faster. It helps your dog pay attention to the sound of the click and not just pay attention to the food. Create a home base for your hands. So many dogs get distracted by the food and training because we're fiddling with our treat pouch or otherwise talking at them with our hands. Home base looks like your hands at your side or behind your back. It also helps to change the position of the treat pouch and get into the habit of periodically training without one. Be a tactical treat dispenser. What that means is that you're paying attention to where you're placing your treats. You always wanna aim for nose level. Why? Because that helps prevent you from accidentally prompting your dog to jump up. Keep your training sessions short and sweet. I like to train in 60 second increments. Maybe I train for 10 minutes with one minute on and one minute off. Shorter sessions are better and can be sprinkled throughout the day. If you're new to clicker training, remember that it's not just your dog who's learning, you are too. So remember to positively reinforce yourself as well. All right, um, so clicker training is really useful um, because we can, again, mark those moments that our dogs are doing the right thing. Um, you don't have to use a clicker necessarily. Um, you can use a kind of marker word like yes, um, or if you can uh, do like a tongue click, um, that way you can always have it with you. Um, but the clicker is nice and loud and obvious to our dogs in the environment. Um, so that's uh, usually why we start with a clicker. Um, because it's so unique and uh, attention grabbing. Um, but yeah, you can use you can use anything as a marker as long as you've associated it with the food, like Donna showed in the video. Well, so one of the most important things um, to be able to do for our dogs um, that have reactivity is to be able to get their attention on us when we ask for that. Um, this is going to be really important because if they can look away um, from the trigger, right, um, then they're much less likely to um, keep going towards it. Um, so this is a really helpful one, again, if you're trying to just kind of get out of there quickly um, and to avoid using that sort of lure. If they have attention on cue, you can get their attention and then move away. Um, so that can be a, a really powerful behavior too. Um, so I'll go ahead and play this video for you guys so you can see um, how to uh, teach your dog that attention on cue. 
The ability to get your dog's attention at any given moment is an important part of living a good life with our four-legged friends. It's so important that it's a good idea to have more than one way of getting your dog's attention. Most of us expect our dogs to look at us when we say their names. That's why this activity is called the name game. You can, of course, play this game with a secondary word like look or something more unique. My dog's name is Hope and I'll be using the word look for this game. First, get your equipment ready. You'll need a clicker, a treat pouch, and some tasty treats. Next, set up your a learning environment that's free from distractions. Start by saying your word and then clicking your dog the moment she looks at you. Look. Look. Notice that the only thing my dog has to do is look at me. I'm not asking them to do anything else. Look. It helps to toss your treat nearby to reset your dog's position so she can then look back up at you when you say your word. Look. 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 Practice this for 10 repetitions and then put the clicker away. Practice this a few times a day, and in a few days, you'll have a new way of getting your dog's attention. You can check for understanding. All right, so um, yeah, getting attention on cue, again, is very, very useful. And the reason why um, it's a good idea to start this um, indoors with your dog is because of the much less distracting environment, right? So they are much more likely to actually be able to give you that attention inside. Uh, and so once you're getting that um, very solidly from your dog indoors, you can start then um, you know, moving it around into different rooms in the house uh, and then maybe out into your backyard, which is a very familiar environment, right? Um, and then trying it out on like um, different trails and things like that. Um, but yeah, uh, really working on these things inside is going to be a really valuable place to start so that your dog um, can learn and be successful. Okay, um, the next thing is walking on a loose leash. So a lot of dogs, um, you know, will pull on leash, very, very common. Um, and for reactive dogs, again, any tension on the leash is going to add to their stress levels, add to their frustration and feelings of vulnerability on that leash. Um, and so we really want to uh, make it highly rewarding for them to stay in a loose leash walk, right, where they're able to stay next to you or around you and not put any tension on that leash. Um, so this is another one that's a really good idea um, to practice um, indoors first, again, so that your dog is really starting to understand, okay, I always just walk uh, next to you, I keep this uh, leash loose myself, um, especially for bigger dogs, uh, we, we really can't control them on the leash, so we want them to be um, making the active choice to stay with us, right? Um, so so uh, helping them learn how to do that indoors first. Um, so this is uh, another video on kind of how to do that loose leash walking. Hi y'all, I'm trainer Donna, and this is your Training Tip Tuesday. Today, we're going to help you guys out with the most popular dog parenting topic, loose leash walking. There are many ways to teach our dogs how to walk well on a leash. I'm going to tell you the secret to lifelong, lovely, loose leash walking. The secret is attention. Dogs that freely and frequently offer attention are infinitely better at walking on a leash without pulling. Why? Because they check in with you for direction, they stay within the length of the leash, and they're eager to be connected with you on the walk, no matter what stinky things they find. Here's a quick way to jumpstart attention on your walks. Using your clicker and your treat pouch, you're gonna click for attention. Uh, 
I find it helps to have my treat couch on the side that I want my dog to walk. As your dog gets good at this, you can alternate praise or click treats for attention. Let's go. Good girl, very nice. Good girl. I'm trying. So it looks very simple in this video, um, but I'm sure a lot of us know that it doesn't necessarily feel that simple um, out and about. So um, again, starting it in your house um, and really um, focusing on clicking and treating them while they are in that loose leash, loose leash position, sorry, um, and, and really focusing on that um, so that they start to understand that it's most rewarding um, to be within the length of the leash. They don't need to pull on the leash um, because actually what they want is going to be um, to be with you and uh, to get those treats, right? So uh, definitely work on this as well because again, um, having a nice loose leash block is going to uh, decrease those instances of reactivity. And it also gives your dog um, a really easy sort of default position to be in when you're outside. Hi, y'all. Okay, um, so, so next what we're gonna talk about is training a positive interrupter. Um, this is also called Find It. Um, and what this can do for, for you um, and your dog on a walk is to distract them from something that they're uh, seeing. Um, so if it's something that they you know, get excited about or reactive about, being able to, again, pull that gaze away um, from the thing that they're interested in and distract them to something else can be really, really helpful. I'll go ahead and play this video. Hi y'all, I'm trainer Donna and this is my dog Hope and this is your training tip Tuesday. Today, we're gonna teach y'all all about Find It. Go find it. Find It is a very, very useful skill to teach your dog because it teaches your dog to bring their nose to the ground on a cue. When would that be useful? It's useful in everyday situations. Go find it when you need to distract your dog and maybe move them away from something or move them back towards you or when you need to change directions on a walk. It's so much easier to do that when you can get your dog's attention off of the surroundings and down to the ground and then you choose which direction you're moving. Go find it. Teaching Find It's is super easy. You can teach this from the comfort of your own home. You can teach it while you're sitting on the sofa watching TV. It's a very simple game. Here's how you play. There are two simple steps to teaching Find It. First is the verbal cue, what I say with my mouth. And next is going to be the treat toss, which is what I do with my hand, right? So it's pretty simple. You want to set up with treats in your treat pouch. Get that treat pouch around your waist and then bring your hands to your sides or behind your back. You want to be as non-distracting to your dog as possible so they learn to pay attention to that verbal cue, which can be hard for your dog. Find it. Find it. Find it. Find it. I'm trainer Donna, and this is my dog, Hope, and we hope you enjoyed this training tip Tuesday. All right. Um, so again, the find it very easy to teach your dog um, and really, really valuable as a way uh, to distract them um, while you are out and about on walks. Um, so again, as you're uh, managing your dog, uh, building up all of these different training skills um, while you're in the house, right? And then very slowly taking it out maybe into your yard or places where there um, are, are none of their triggers, right? And working on it there. So these are all really good um, foundational skills to have um, before you start working 
on um, counter conditioning, which is what we're going to talk about next. Hi, y'all. Um, but first, just to make sure, does anyone have any questions about any of those training skills that we just went over? All right. Um, well, if you do think of any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, and for now, we're going to talk about counter conditioning. Uh, and that's really just trainer speak uh, for changing our dog's emotions around the things that trigger them. Um, so for a fearful dog, um, we would want him to be you know, unafraid, right? For an overly excited dog, we would want them to be able to be calm. Um, so counter conditioning is a really, really powerful tool um, for helping our um, dogs with overly active behavior. Um, an important thing to say here is that um, counter conditioning and all of this training really um, will be a lot more helpful if you are working with a qualified trainer. Um, so a qualified trainer can help you by, um, you know, kind of uh, having that expertise that allows them to see the complexity of different cases and be able to help you through it and um, get your timing right. Um, a lot of the times these um, situations out and about, they require um, a lot of uh, nuance, right? It can be very, very different in different situations. Um, so, so what counter conditioning really is, is um, uh, kind of sparking this emotional change, right? So in this picture, you can see um, sort of the before image, right? Where dog um, gets very upset at the sight of bicycles or children, right? Um, and then you start pairing it with something delicious like steak, um, and your dog loves steak, so then they start to think, oh, well, the bicycle predicts the steak, which I love, so now I love bicycles, right? So it's really just kind of um, using that uh, power of um, association um, to, to teach them a new way to feel about the things that used to scare them. Um, so, you know, that you can think about this too as, right, um, oh, a bicycle is coming. Um, hey, mom or dad, where is my food, right? That's the kind of reaction you want to see versus like, oh, a bicycle is coming. I'm going to bark and lunge at it, right? Um, and having that sort of different um, emotional state that allows them to make those better choices. Um, so when we are, again, thinking about um, changing their emotions, it's really important to be aware of their um, distance from the trigger, right? So um, this sort of counter conditioning does not work when they are already very, very upset, right? So you see, um, you know, kind of up at the top, we've got what's called the bite threshold, right? Um, but this is sort of the reactivity that we might be seeing, right? Bark, barking and growling, all of that. Um, so if they're up here, this, they're not going to be able to learn in this state. They're already uh, much too excited. Um, and that's where distance comes into play, right? We want them to be at down, down here in these sort of green spaces down here. Um, and that involves getting distance, right? So, so thinking about uh, keeping them uh, feeling safe or um, also that's called under threshold, right? Uh, so that they're able to uh, really engage with you, respond to any cues that you give them um, and be able to calm themselves down, right? So that's where we kind of want to work when we're doing things like um, counter conditioning. Um, we want them to, again, feel uh, like they can focus in on that and that they're not in any sort of danger or they don't need to get too excited um, because that dog is too far away um, or that, you know, that bicycle is too far away, right? whatever it might be. Um, so really looking at um, how, um, how they're feeling, right? Um, and if, again, if they are kind of up in this range, getting that distance first before you ever try, um, you know, bringing out um, the treats and really working on changing their emotions because their emotions won't change if they're already feeling that um, high level of stress. 
Uh, not only do our dogs need to be under threshold while we're working with them, um, but we also need to be aware of this concept called trigger stacking. Uh, and this is when multiple stressors over the course of the day lead to a reaction that they might not otherwise have had, right? Um, so if you had a mail carrier show up unexpectedly on your doorstep and your dog lost their mind and were very, very upset barking and all of that, um, that's probably not the best day to attempt any sort of training walk um, because of what you see here in this graph, which is just that if they've already had one uh, bad encounter with somebody um, and then you add something else that's maybe a little stressful, um, that can bring them up to this higher state where suddenly now they're in this very high stress and reactive um, state of mind. And this isn't just, you know, within the course of a walk, it's really over the course of the whole day. Um, so it can take up to three hours for stress levels to go back down. Um, and that's if the dog is given um, a nice, calm, safe, um, happy environment to kind of go back to and decompress in, right? Um, so, so really thinking about, you know, what, it, what has been happening in your dog's day, how they've been acting and what they've been exposed to and um, really keeping that in mind, right, as you are maybe starting to take them back out again after you've done sort of this initial training. Um, we, we really, really wanna make sure that they're not um, going over this sort of uh, stress line here where they're really out of control, reactive, and can't regulate their emotions or calm themselves down. Um, it's stressful for them and it's stressful for us, uh, and so it's really, really good to keep this in mind um, when you're working with your dog. Um, it's also, you know, good to think about how your dog might need downtime or relaxation or more enrichment activities right, in order to recover from different stressors. Uh, so, you know, if, if you go out on a walk and your dog um, is able to, you know, focus in with you while people walk by on the opposite side of the street, that's great, um, but we also don't want to push it too far, right? So maybe that's when you say, yep, that was a great walk, and go back home, right? Um, so, so really uh, thinking about um, how trigger stacking can influence um, your walks and your uh, and the experiences that your dog is having coming throughout the day. And I know this all sounds like a lot, um, and it definitely can be, right? Um, but uh, it's good to take it slowly and really to move at your dog's pace, right? We all want it to be this kind of nice, smooth line from us to the finish line, um, but the real journey looks more like this, <laughs> um, and that's okay, right? It actually makes that journey um, really worthwhile and rewarding um, when you work through all of these different um, obstacles and triggers and figure this out with your dog, right? That really builds up um, a very uh, strong bond between you and, and it can help them to feel safe in their world um, and help you to feel comfortable, you know, um, with the dog that you have um, and, and helping, um, you know, helping them to sort of operate in their environment in a more stress-free way. And uh, just to reiterate all of this, um, it's really important to work with a qualified trainer on this, right? So um, the sorts of training skills that we talked about first with all those videos, um, those are things that you could practice, you know, inside your house um, and really work on with your dog. Um, but the counter conditioning and all of that and changing your dog's emotion, it's really important that you work with a qualified trainer who can help you through that process and give you that sort of ongoing support and help you really learn your dog thresholds and how to train there. Um, and again, keeping it nice and uh, slow and steady progress. Um, it's really important when you are searching for a trainer um, to ask questions and make sure that uh, they're the type of trainer that you want. Um, dog training is an unregulated industry. Uh, and what that means is that any person can call themselves a dog trainer. Um, and, uh, you know, they might not have any background in science or behavior at all. Um, so, so definitely, you know, ask things like, you know, what's going to happen if my dog gets it right? Are, there, are they going to get a treat? Um, what's going to happen if my dog gets it wrong, right? You don't want anybody who's going to punish or correct your dog um, for, for their um, choices or reactions, 
great. Again, we want someone who is going to reward your dog and really work to change those emotions um, in a positive way. And um, if you have, you know, very specific questions that we didn't get a chance to address here, you're welcome to uh, reach out to us at our behavior help desk. Um, by uh, emailing training at sfhumanesociety.org or calling the number here on the screen. Okay, um, does anyone have any last questions? We've got a few minutes left here. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, you can unmute or type them in chat. Okay, um, Candace asked, can we get a copy of the threshold graphic? Um, and do you have a list of qualified trainers in Santa Fe? Um, yes, I will be sending along a copy of the threshold graphic in um, the follow-up email. And I will also be um, sending out a document called um, how to find a qualified trainer, um, which uh, will give you, again, some, some links to trainer databases and also some questions and things to look for in your trainers. Um, so, so definitely uh, take a look at that um, because, yeah, they can, they can definitely help you out. Um, any other questions from anyone uh, before we close out here? All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. I hope you learned a lot. Um, if, if you got even one thing from this presentation, um, we'd really uh, love it if you consider donating. Um, that allows us to uh, keep going with these uh, presentations and offering them free of charge to the community. Um, so again, uh, thank you so much for coming. And um, another big thank you to Purina for sponsoring these events. Um, and uh, thank you all for your support of the Santa Fe Animal Shelter. <laughs>